Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 30th of the fifth month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, which happens to line up with August 10th, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing with our coverage of Bereshit, or Genesis chapter 46, with Yaakov, the patriarch, now coming into Egypt. Just a little recap for everyone. They've had the patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov have all lived. They've had, even Yaakov's had his children, where they've done right and wrong. They've had chastisement and benefit from obedience to the truth given to them. And they've all, the patriarchs in particular, in their lives have walked out things that would be for foretelling purposes for their children later on, which we've talked about a little bit. We will cover a lot more in more detail as we go through. I could keep saying these things all the time, and I will as we get to them, but it's important. It was not always known how these things work. As far as I know, the explanation for Abraham walking out things that were of his children that would walk it out later on of the pre-covenant times before they were in the land. I don't know if that was ever explained to anyone until Irenaeus and his against heresies. Now, I might be mistaken on where that's recollected, but my point is it was not until the apostolic times where the fullness of this revelation was made known, which is exactly what we can read from the Bible. Okay. <clears throat> so I don't like to get too far into that when I just I want to point it out and everyone that is of the truth, if you're following along, it he'll bring you to these things. And when you hear about it, you, you'll know. And if you're not certain that you don't have to believe anything till it's proven. But back on track here. Yaakov now being confirmed that his son, Yahusuf, who had been lost to him for quite some time, is actually the second in command to Pharaoh in Egypt, or Mitzrayim, and he is now going to be journeying to him. It says, And so he took out, or set out, Yisrael, and all which unto him, and he came to, that's Be'ara, that's, that's to Be'er Sheba, or the well of the oath. And he sacrificed sacrifices unto Elohim, or unto the Eloah of his fathers, or of his father Yitzhak, sorry. And he said Elohim to Yisrael in the visions of the night. And he said, Yaakov, Yaakov. And he said, here I am, Hanini, right? And he said, Anoki Ha'el Elohi Abika. So he says, I am the El, Eloa of your father. Not do fear. So, so this is um, Al, like we'd say Al Bundy, right? But this is Al, not El in pronunciation. And this is one of the two words that's a negative. You have lo, which is never, as in never steal, never murder. And then you have al here, which is a temporary injunction. Do not, right? As subjective negative, right? Neither, not, there, nor, okay? It's, it's just another way of saying no but it's not as permanent, if you will. The point is the one who has the power, right? The L is the power, is also the one who has the power to say no. This is no fear to go down to Mitzrayim. For Lagoy, it says, for unto a nation great, Ashemka. I will make you. He literally, I, 
I, there, you. Remember, Shem is there or here. It's where you're at. To put, place, or set is shum. Okay? They have it as appointed, assigned, quite a few different words. But literally, it's where you're at, what where he set you, or the place that you are put. And it says, for lagoy gadol ashimka. It says, for unto a nation great, I you i put you there okay ashim kashem there so i will make i will there you there this is literally how that works but in the english we'd say i will make you there okay it says i will go down anoki arad it says i i down the aleph there is i will or i am and then the rad is the going down just like uh Jared he will come down or Yarden the it comes down from Dan the Jordan that Ra Resh Dalit is to come down you put the Yod there Yarad it's the same word as the patriarch Jared they call him and it means he will come down to descend this is an I, I go down with you from Mitzrayim, and I, I bring you up also. And then it says, LA, to go up, ascend, or climb. And Yahusuf will put his hand upon your eyes. If you recall, at this point, Yisrael or Yaakov's eyes were dim and he had trouble seeing. Just as Yitzhak in his old age, his eyes being dim and he had trouble seeing, it was Yaakov's coming that had the restoration of his eyes and he was able to perceive his two sons, Louis and Yahuda, to whom he foretold the kahuna would go to Louis and the kingdom or Malkuth would go to Yahuda. You find that information in the book of Yobelim. But again, those are foretelling the events in the patriarchs that would also happen later on. And you see the same thing here. It says, Why you come? And he arose, or and he stood Yaakov from Beersheba, and he carried the sons of Israel. Eth Yaakov, their father, Wa Eth, the little ones, the, the their little ones. This is Tafem, very close to the word Tafe, which is the Taf, Tafi is children, but it also means girls, infants, little ones. And Te Tafi is the little branch. She was the little one of, uh, Zadik Yahu, if you remember. That's where that word comes from, or it's related to it. It says, Wa'eth and the wives in their carts, which went up, or uh, Selah, which had sent, rather, Pharaoh to carry Eth him. So they took, right? So they took Eth their livestock, Wa'eth their goods, which they had required in the land of Canaan. And he went to Mitzrayim, Yaakov, and all his seed. They say descendants here, but that's Zerah or Zaro, they call it. Zoro, Zerah, the same as uh, very similar to Yahuda's uh, son there, right? And its offspring or to sow seed. It's also to sow or scatter abroad, which is what happened with Zerah and his descendants. While Peretz generally stayed with the people, Zerah's descendants were spread abroad at that time. And we've covered that in a few different places. But they're the ones, they're the ones that were the leaders of the migrating Hebrews in the pre-migrations before Moshe and in the things that happened afterwards. 
the sons of Zerah were leading them or ruling over those peoples as they traveled. This is and his descendants with him, his sons and his sons of his sons with him, his daughters and his daughters of his sons and all his descendants or in all his seed rather the coming with him to Mitzrayim. It says, Wa ele. They translate that as now these, but it's literally and these, ale, right? Or the former, at one as the other, right? The same. Right, so it's like now such it was, or now the same were, and they just put it now these. It's just a way to translate that. But and these, the names of the sons of Yisrael who went to Egypt, Yaakov and his sons. The core, the firstborn of Yaakov was Reuben. That that is, behold him, or behold. His son, right? Reuben. And remember, it says, Behold the son, for he's begotten a male child. And that's why they named him Reuben. If you all are familiar, or for anyone that might not be in the uh, video, uh, listen to this later. Yes, we're on 47 now. Sorry about that. Or sorry, we're on 46. But for anyone who's not familiar, the meanings of the names of the patriarchs are significant. The order that they're put, both the order they're born in, the list that they're given in by the Yaakov and Moshe, in the Barakas that, that are given, their order of marching around the, the wilderness tabernacle, the order they're given in Revelation, all of that's significant. All these things have meaning. And if you look at the meaning of the name, and what that represents, it'll give you a parable of another picture, right? If you just think about it. This might even foretell the things that his children would be doing. I can't speak for definitively about all of those things. I haven't personally looked into it. But on like this one, for example. But for the genealogy of Adam to Noah, that's an easy one. Man appointed mortal sorrow, but the Baruch Elohim, he will come down dedicating or teaching. Um, that his death will bring the, dis the despairing comfort and rest, right? That's just Adam to Noah. And you can actually go from Adam all the way to Yaakov and see a message that like that that's pretty significant. I believe um, it was the founded Earth Brothers they have a video where they looked at one of the genealogies and it was uh, something that his father had discovered when he was younger that in, I believe it's the genealogy for Luke or the, or the other one, there's no of, it's just a list of names and there's no other connecting words. So when you look at just the list of the meaning of the names, it tells an amazing thing. And he actually has a, a thing where he'd gone over that. I'm fairly certain if these are legitimate and they're still accurate, you can do that with pretty much anything where he has names and places and a narrative. If you look at what the names mean, you look at the names of the people involved or what they represent, and you can see a parable of something else that he's trying to, to say because there's nothing that he has not spoken in parables. It mentions that directly when he was in the flesh teaching to them. He, and then you can see that throughout the other parts of Scripture, and it's explained by him and elsewhere that those that are his that come to him to have him be their teacher for what the truth is, he reveals the meaning of his parables that he tells to everyone to whom it is given. The rest of them it's not given, but to them it's in parables. So... He's not inconsistent. He's true with everything that he he said. And you can literally go through every word and learn what it means. Palu, like paleo, 
is a wonder. Behold the sun dedicating in the wonder. What is this one? It comes from Chatzar, which means an abode, a settlement or a village. Right? So my point is, we won't do that right now, but I'm trying to show you what you can do. You could just take the names for Reuben, go through each one, get the meanings of them, and you might have to dig more than just the Strong's on here. Sometimes I find etymologies for names in very interesting places. But if you seek with the desire of knowing the truth, and you, you do things according to his will, and you pray and ask for help, his Ruach will lead you into all truth, just as he said. So with that, we'll, we'll move on. And it says, And <clears throat> the sons of Reuben, Hanok and Palu, and Hezron, or Hetzron, rather, and Carmi, and the sons of Shimon, Yamuel, and Yamin, and Ohad, and Yakin, and Zohar, Zohar, sorry, and Shaul, which this is an interesting word just for a dichotomy here. You can see asked of Yah, the first king, right? But it, it means literally a gift or to be asked for, right? To ask or inquire. You can see here, it's there's another word that's close that's also ruin, but that's not it. That doesn't have a lamed. To ask or inquire, to ask. Right there, this is of a feminine suffix and also means an affair. A request or a thing asked for. All right. And then, oh, it doesn't give you that. So when you have a wa there, it wouldn't show you. But the other spelling for that, Shaul there. Oh, I have to find it here. If you click over, you can see. Oh, I have to go back the other way. Sorry about that. It's the underworld. It's the place of the dead. But it's also, oh, it doesn't have it here. I'll find it in the other one, but Shaul or in um, Ernest Klein's dictionary, this word is a gift. So the grave, the same word for the grave or Sheol, the place of the dead, and that has two meanings. It's literally the grave site, the sepulcher, where you would bury the body of someone who's dead. And they'd also call Shaul the place of the habitation of the dead, where it had a more larger significance, where your soul goes, if you will, or your immortal inner being when your body dies. In 4th Ezra, it mentions it specifically. But after you die, you're, you're presented before the Father. And you're either confounded or you're in shalom in seven ways based on your love and obedience to his word or not. And then you have a week for your ruach or your inner being to see creation as it is for what it is. And then after that week of days, you're taken to the place of your habitation, whether right next to the lake of fire, which is the place that you're going to be having the prospect of joining after the great white throne judgment, or in the place of the rest of the righteous, where there is light and a fountain, and everyone is in contentment and shalom. So um, that is also a gift which was my point in trying to share that with you, but it doesn't seem to be right here. So I'll find that and put it in the telegram for you. And if I can get a screenshot on uh, YouTube, I'll, I'll put it there as well. But we'll continue real quick. Shoal. And it says, the son of the Canaanitis. All right. So Shaul was the son of the woman of Canaan that Shimon married, and he later repented, married a different woman, and presumably had these three children. Or, sorry, these other children. Sorry. And the sons of Louis. Now, we haven't covered this before in detail, 
but we will when we get to the book of Yobelim. You have to remember, he doesn't play favorites. He's impartial. He has one standard. So if he said that, for example, if everyone made an oath to keep the allotment that was set for them, and then you later break that oath, you're cursed. And that curse meant that every one of them was under the ban. They're all going to be destroyed. And Abraham, who was repenting and coming to the truth, was told, don't, don't mix with them. Don't marry or have children with any of them because they're all going to be cut off. And he passed that down to his children. Because they were all outside of the purview in favor of our maker, his Ruach was taken from them and the adversarial Ruach was given to the Canaanites. They were all involved in witchcraft or what we would call paganism today. They were all doing satanic rituals, if you will, and keeping pagan festivals. And because of that, they had the adversarial spirit and they were generally doing the things that that Satan and demons wanted them to, which is why you can see they attacked Egypt, they took it over, they persecuted the children, they closed off the borders, and they did everything that you can read about in scripture and history and the Obelim and things like that because of the, the spirit in them directing that. When Simon and Yahuda, Shimon and Yahuda married Canaanine women and had children with them, it doesn't change the fact that those children are under the ban. Every one of them that will ever be born from period. And that's doesn't can that doesn't cease to be. Just like Lot's children, they're going to be wiped out. Doesn't matter how many generations happen. There's no difference from the the judgment against Cain for what he did with Abel. He had generations of children before the flood, but not one of them survived it. So these are things that we have to keep in mind. Every one of those individual men, women, and children would have done things that deserved death because we all get according to what we deserve. But that's the inheritance that he, that's the children he was deserving. And that's what he got because of what he chose to do in his life. That's something that we have to keep in mind. That's why we want to be mindful. But Shimon repented and the children not born of her would not be in that position. The children of Yahuda that were not from the Canaanite woman was Tamar's children, and they're the only ones that were ever given the kingdom. But there were other children of Yahuda that were constantly apostate with them the whole time, if you recall, until they were uh, brought to obedience through the obedience of those around them for a while. But these are these are reasons why some people don't get things some people do there's eternal consequences for the things that go on in life and that's why he says he'll favor whom he favors right it's not for us to judge or to, we don't know the nuances of all those things as we see we should judge we don't judge those that are outside but anyone that professes to be a believer we, we're supposed to come together examine the things that differ study it to show ourselves approved i mean to, we have to be circumspect and careful if someone doesn't want to believe, you don't judge them, don't fight, don't argue. But those that profess to be believers, we have to come to one accord. And the one accord should be according to what he said with multiple witnesses. But back on point here. And the sons of Louis, Gresham, Kohath, you can see that's with a Kof, or what we call a Q in English, not the K, but it's, co it's commonly given a K, because we use a Q with a U in English, and, and we don't do that with a K. However, to be more accurate, we should probably use the Q when it's required with a Kof there. But Kohath and Merari. <clears throat> and the sons of Yahuda, Ur, and Onan, and Selah, and Peretz, and Zerah. But died Ur and Onan in the land of Canaan. And it came to be that the sons of Peretz, Hezron, and Chomol, and the sons of Yishakar, Tola. Doesn't, yeah, see, 
the same as tola the word this word right here the tola is an amazing word it's that you worm Yaakov, right when he talks about he's like a worm and no man despised of the people i believe that's in the psalms 23 he it's calling him a tola and it's literally the crimson worm if you're not familiar with it it's an amazing word study that has to do with a dye. This worm is what they use for scarlet dye and the way that it lives, how it is collected, the stuff that this, this worm does is all prophetic, if you will. It all foretells the significance of our Mashiach and his deliverance over his people. It's an amazing thing right in that crimson worm that's in scripture too. But that's actually the name of one of the sons of, uh, who is that? Of Yeshikar there. Sorry about that. So, and Pau, and Yob, afflicted, and Shimron, and the sons of Zebulun, Sered, and Elan, and Yachiel, to wait for El, Yachi, Yachil El, right? Yachel is to wait or await. So he awaited El. Excuse me. These were the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padan Aram, together with Dina, his daughter, Although Dina died, it doesn't mention that here, but she died around the same time Bilhah did at the discovery or at the um, at the selling of Yahusaf into slavery. When that happened on the ninth evening of the tenth month, and he mourned all that night and all that tenth day of the tenth month, for the loss of his son that whole year he was mourning but within that month dina through affliction and mourning and bilhah both died and because of that he had mourned for a month and it was instituted for the children perpetually that that's the day that we afflict our beings on for grieving the affections of our father for what was happened or for what had happened it says all the persons his sons and his daughters were 30 shilishim and three. And the sons of Gad, Ziphon and Hegai and Shuni, or Shuni and Esbon, Eri and Arodi, Arodi, yeah, and Areli. Uh, that's Areli, this is the lion of El, or El is my lion, right? Huh. Ariel, if you have the Yod right here, it's the Lion of El. It says Ariel, Ariel, the city which in which uh, Dawid dwelled. It's one of the foretellings in Scripture, if you remember. But it says, in the sons of Asher, Imna and Yishwa and Yeshu, they say Yeshiv. They, they have a V right here, Ishva right here. But that would be modern Hebrew. This wa as a, as a V phonetic is not until after the Babylonian captivity. Before then, the only V that you have in the Hebrew that I'm aware of is right here. When you have a, the letter bait and it doesn't have the dogish in it, that makes the V sound, they say. When this is being pronounced, you have the oo with a sorig here, you you attach the and, and that softens that, so it changes it from uvria, uvria, instead of and berea. But that's still the word berea. It's just the way that the language itself would function. This changes in the way it's spoken when you add a prefix. Um nation and national you do it in english too we don't think twice about it but we don't normally change a b into a v anymore or add 
prefixes and suffixes to a word itself um, in that capacity, unless it's like un, in, and things of that nature, right? So we still have that phenomenon, but a lot of times we'll use an entire different word. We just put and, for example. It's a different word instead of putting it as a prefix to it. Either way, V's would not make the V sound at this time. So this would be Ishwa and Ishwi, not V, just so you know. And Berea and Sarah, their sisters, and the sons of Berea, Heber and Malik, Malikel, Malikel, sorry, Mikael. <clears throat> Malikel. I had that right the first time. These were the sons of Zilpha, whom she gave Laban, or whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter. And she bore eth these unto Jacob. Six and ten, or sixteen souls. It says persons there, but that's Nefesh, which is a soul or a living being. The sons of Rachel or Rachel, the wife of Yaakov, Yahusuf wa Benjamin and Ben, right? It's Yahusuf and Benjamin, they say, or Benjamin. And were begotten unto Yahusuf in the land of Mitzrayim, which he bore unto him, or which, yeah, he bore unto him Asnath, the daughter of Pontifar, the Kohen of On, Eth. Manashe wa eth Ephraim. And the sons of Benjamin, you notice all the others didn't have that before them all the time. Just something to keep in mind. And the sons of Benjamin, Bela and Bechar and Ashbel and Gera and Naaman, Ahi and Rosh. Mufim or Mupim and Hupim and Arad. These were the sons of Rachel or Rachel who were born to Yaakov. All soul or all Nefesh, 14 or 4 and 10. And the son of Dan, Hushim. In the Testament of Dan, and I believe in the book of Yobelim, you'll see that he had five children. The four of them died and he only had one survive in the land there because of the way that he was in his life it says and the sons of naphtali Yahaz or yezreel ya yahaz el sorry and guni and yazir and shalim these the sons of bilha whom or which gave laban to Rachel, his daughter. And she bore eth these unto Yaakov, all, nephesh, seven. All the nephesh, right, all the souls going with Yaakov to Mitzrayim, and they came of his loins, right? They came of his thigh, loin, side, or base, Iraq. And then Malabad, this says besides, but it's literally from separation or apart. So from apart, which is literally apart from in English, which is what besides means, right? Be apart from the wives of the sons of Jacob and all the souls were 60 and 6. The sons of Yahusuf who were born to him in, in Mitzrayim, the souls were two, and all the nephesh of the house of Yaakov who went to Egypt, 70. And some accounts will say 75. When you keep in mind the children of Dan that passed away, that, that's regarding them. <clears throat> it says, and Yahuda he sent, or sent before his presence to Yahusuf, to point out, it says unto, to throw or shoot, right? 
unto directing the way before his face, or to Goshen. And he came him to the land of Goshen, and so gathered, that says, and he, Asar, sorry, not Asaf, but, and he, tie, bind, or in prison. They translated that as made ready. But he made ready Yahusuf, or he tied Yahusuf. He bound his chariot and went up to meet Yisrael, his father, to Goshen. And he, it says, presented himself, but this is Wa Yara. So, and he saw, right? And he saw to him, and he fell. So it means that, it, and he came, or he saw him, and he fell. He came to him, and he fell before, upon his neck, rather, and wept on, or upon his neck, at that time. Going around yet still again, right? Ode. And he said, Yisrael, to Yahusuf, Amota, let me die now. Hapetem, a beat, foot, anvil, or occurrence. So it says, it's like uh, in the drum beat, or now in the course of, in the march of it, right? In the course of what he's doing, he says, now let me die, right? Since I have seen at your face, for still at this time ongoing, right? For yet you live. And he said, Yahusuf, to his brothers and to the house of his father, I will go up and tell, and Yagad, right? And I will declare unto Pharaoh and say to him, My brothers and the house of my father, which in the land of Canaan have come, or he come to me. Now you see that L right here, that's a sere, and this is pronounced Eli or LA right here, but that L instead of an owl sound makes it two, and then the yod is me. Had this also been a sere yod, that would have been L L or L L E, and that would have been two. Well, actually, they don't actually talk like that. But when you have a a sere yod, it means the whatever of. When you have it as just a regular yod that's taking possession of, like mine, me. So this is to me, literally, with the le or la rather. This is they have come to me, and the men, and the mortals, if you will, the shepherds of their flocks. For the men of or for men of livestock, they have been, or they are, and the flocks and their herds, and all which unto them they have brought. And it came to be when he calls unto them Pharaoh and says, What your occupation, or what is it that you do? Right? And you will say, or and they will say, the men of livestock have been your servants, Obedika, right, from our youth, and even and at this time. So it says from Noratinu, so from our or, Noraninu, from our youth, and Ed Wa Ed, and witnessed Eta at this time, or now, as they translate that. Remember the word na, they translate as please, but that's literally in English where we get the word now. And ata is where we get the word like at. And where it's like now in the sense of at that time, right occurring as it happens as we speak. But it says, and at the time, both we, anachnu, with, or and also, Abi, or our fathers, says, in serving Teshub, you may dwell in the land of Goshen. So it says, and Pharaoh is saying, and you shall say to the livestock, and even now that 
um, that we may dwell within the land of Goshen for an abomination to the Mitzriites, all shepherding a flock. Now, it's covered in the recognitions of Clement in the most detail, but the things that, and also for a non-scriptural resource, if you want, you can look at Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons. But in the course of time, the Egyptians, because they were worshiping Nimrod and they, they served a man over their maker and had other issues going on, they went topsy-turvy from what was his desire to do all things that were abominable. So they venerated the creatures that were not kosher, if you will, and they abominated the things that were clean. So by the time the Hebrews in dispersion are going into the land here as shepherds of flocks, all of those flocks are an abomination to the Egyptians because they neither sacrifice them nor eat them. They, they worship those, a lot of the animals that were abominable to the Hebrews. And um, they didn't kill any of those that the Hebrews would use for offerings and eating. I don't know all the details on that in particular. It's not something I've gone into personally. There is a great deal of information on that. Another source, if you want, in book one of Diodorus Socorus's history, he actually covers the antediluvian period a little bit. And he starts with <clears throat> the first major civilization that he goes into the history of is the history of Egypt, because he mentions astrology, the arts, and a lot of the mystery religions all stem from it, which we are commonly taught it comes from Nimrod and Babylon. But if you follow along with the chronology of events and what happens in history, they're all one. They divide up the land by allotment. And after the divisions of the lands, they go and make the tower and Babel and, and that. But there's already, there's some people in dispersion. There's some people that were not gathered together. And Nimrod, <clears throat> as you can see in detail in that history from Diodorus to Chloris, which I'll put, a de I'll put a link in the description for a video for it. But if you take the time to listen, you'll hear about the history of the Egyptians and what happened for them. Uh, when they were in the land there, they went out and then into Babylon. And it was Osiris, a.k.a. Nimrod, who did that and conquered all these different lands, although they call him a benefactor and saying he was doing right and helping the people. He established the different places where his sons were ruling over, like Macedon was the son of Nimrod or Osiris that was the king of that area. But... um. It was after that time that you had the Tower of Babel and then the scattering of the peoples and, and all of those things going on. <clears throat> Correction. Alexander Hislop talks about it too. Cush was involved with the times during the, the Tower of Babel. After that dispersion and scattering, they would have went into Egypt. This was when Cush, Ham, Mitzrayim, and Nimrod were learning to do magic, if you will, that's mentioned in the recognitions, and then being led by demons and knowing the promises of, of what was given to Shem, they went in to conquer and attack that area, set up mystery religions and pervert it right by the Garden of Eden, right? But that's all for later on in what we're covering here. So if you just give me one moment, we might be wrapping things up or not. Uh, recording. All right, Shalom. I'm sorry. We're going to have to wrap things up with our reading for today on this. But thank you all for attending, and we will see you next week. You all have a wonderful Sabbath, a great week ahead, and Yahuwah be with you. Shalom.